Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Uh, it's Tuesday, February 1st. Uh, it's 1.30. Uh, my name is Zach Bell, the uh, chair for the committee. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people here with us today. Uh, we have Hal Perry, permanent members. We have Hal Perry, Gordon McNeely, Lynn Lund, Mark McLean. Uh, visiting uh, in the chamber today, we have uh, Sonny Gallant. And uh, joining us online, we have uh, Ola Hammerland. And uh, I think that is it. Um, so we do have a, a relatively uh, busy day today. And we're going to first get a uh, motion for adoption to get into that busy day. Uh, Gordon McNeely, thank you. Um, so first we're going to be get, receiving a briefing from the Workers' Compensation Board of PEI on a number of different topics. Uh, we have Cheryl Painter, the CEO, Stephen Carpenter, the Senior Legal Advisor, Kate Marshall, Director of Workplace Services. So I think if it's all right with our presenters, what we will do is we'll let you get right into your presentation and then we'll uh, have some time for questions at the end. Uh, just a reminder for the presentation as well, um, we do have a, a, a presenter after you, uh, roughly around uh, 2.30, so um, if you can uh, just kind of keep that in mind for questions and for uh, the presentation. So I'll let you all take away. And Trish Altus is also joining us uh, uh, online. So thank you, Trish. Sorry for uh, just saw your camera come on there now. All right. So I'll let you, uh, you all take it away. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Uh, we'll get right into this. This is a uh, briefing from the Workers' Compensation Board of PEI, kind of a uh, very uh, preliminary table stakes kind of thing, knowing that there are some precise questions. Um, we will get through this presentation and get, get to those. So we'll start right in. Uh, Jody, you can advance the slide. Um, what is workers' compensation? It is a no-fault compensation uh, insurance program for workers in the province of Prince Edward Island. Um, collective liability, security of benefits to injured workers, independent administration from government, and exclusive jurisdiction, meaning unless you are uh, excluded from our uh, legislation and or regulations, you are required to be uh, part and parcel of the workers' compensation system. Go ahead, Jody. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I just wanted you to know that we're in year four of a five-year strategic plan. Um, uh, the link is there, and I will leave that to your, to your reading pleasure. The next slide is just perhaps a more visual appealing uh, summary of our uh, strategic plan. Moving right into some of the roles and responsibilities surrounding workers' compensation. Um, those on the call know all too well, legislative assembly, the lawmakers. Um, we have two pieces of legislation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, being the Workers' Compensation Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Act and associated regulations. Uh, Executive Council appoints our Board of Directors members. Uh, my role in the Chief Executive Office Officer and our Occupational Health and Safety Advisory Council members. Our Minister is um, the Ministry of Economic Growth, Tourism, Culture, and our Minister is uh, the, the sponsor of legislation, regulations, and compliance. Uh, reporting and ultimately accounting, uh, accountable for our results on the floor of the legislature. Our board of directors is charged with governance and oversight of all we do, and we'll get into that. Our advisory council advises on matters of occupational health and safety. Um, I'm going to be a little careful in how and just point out for your, your reference, the Workers' Compensation Board I'll use as the entity, the operation, and the Board of Directors I'll try to use as our governing body. Uh, sometimes the two get intermingled when we just say board. So the board, the operation, is charged with uh, the operations, obviously, workplace safety, the compensation and benefits and services, the accident fund management, and uh, we will talk a little bit about the appeal uh, funnel and the internal reconsideration. The first stop of appeal uh, happens under the board operations under my management. The department has a two-prong responsibility. They are also um, outside of this board, the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism, Culture, through the Director of Labor, 
has two independent office, Office of the Employer Advisor and Office of the Worker Advisor and the Appeals Tribunal reporting in um, separate and distinct and independent from us here. Go ahead, Jody. Two acts, sometimes uh, some matters get confused between the two. The Workers' Compensation Act really outlines uh, benefits reducing the impact of workplace injury and illness through a sustainable system of medical aid, wage loss benefits, and return to work programs. The Occupational Health and Safety Act deals with just that, workplace uh, health and safety, and deals with provincially regulated workplaces. Again, just a little bit uh, further into oversight and responsibilities. We do have um, a robust board of directors here. Currently, uh, we have members are appointed by executive council to represent uh, workers or employers in equal numbers. Currently, we have three and three plus our board chair. So we have a board of directors of seven and they do such things as uh, policy, policy amendments, programs, help us with our strategic plan. <laughs> I apologize, I do have a cough. Uh, they approve our operating budget, uh, appoint our auditors, uh, recommend amendments to those two pieces of legislation we talked about, and we have touched on the advisory council. They do provide advice twofold, one to our director of occupational health and safety on all things operational, and two to the board of directors if it happens to be legislative in nature surrounding occupational health and safety. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but underneath the Act, the regs, we have a very robust policy uh, collection here, somewhere in the vicinity of 150 that guides the fair and equitable uh, application of um, uh, benefits, mostly, um, and we do a good amount of stakeholder consultation in amending, uh, suggesting, bettering those, those policies. And at the bottom of the slide there, I did list a few uh, kind of significant or substantive policy consultations that were held just last year. Uh, we will talk a little bit later about disclosure of OHS information. I think there was a specific question in there one of the members wanted to cover. Um, employer registration, personal coverage, uh, and travel and related expenses were some of the significant consultations held. Um, this is where a lot of the questions come from. <coughs> and Jody, I might get you to skip to the next slide. That's a little bit better visual. Uh, given my druthers, I may have uh, had this be a funnel um, for your for your interpretation here. This is kind of the appeals process. And if we start at the top, uh, WCB decision. So any decision we make is appealable. That's the basis of which we should start this. And just to give you an uh, idea of context, last year we had uh, just over 1,700 claims, and we have on average year to year within those claims about 4,000 decisions. So within those claims, we have an over 90% acceptance rate. The first line of appeal, should a worker or an employer want to appeal a decision that we have made, is inside this building outside of, you'll hear from Kate's uh, division of decision makers a little bit later. Um, that request for an internal reconsideration or first line of appeal has to be made within 90 days. And typically we see that pool of about, I'm using round numbers now, 1,700 claims or 4,000 de decisions if you picture a funnel, it comes down to about plus minus 100 internal reconsiderations in the run of the year. Um, if uh, that decision from an internal reconsideration is wanting to be peeled yet again, there is within a 30 day uh, period, a mechanism through an appeals tribunal that's independent completely of this office and is supported should an employer or a worker see fit by the free services of the office of the worker or employer advisor. So if you take those plus minus 100 um, IRO acronyms, uh, decisions that may be made in the year, plus minus a couple dozen to 30 might make it to the appeals tribunal. 
and the very pointed end of the funnel where we never like things to go, it, during my time here in two and a half years, there's been one court of appeal pay, case. So if you start from 4,000 and get down to one, it helps with context. Go ahead, Jody. <clears throat> Outside of case uh, mechanics and case details and decisions, we do have a contact here for, I'll say, uh, service-related issues. More often than not, the vast majority are uh, attached to a claim or a claim decision, and this line is pretty quiet, but it's good for everybody to know on the on the call that it exists, should there be concerns that want to be expressed about our service, timeliness, ability to answer questions, politeness, things of that nature. This line will not get into case particulars, but deals with service. Go ahead, Jody. Just want to uh, provide a little bit of context. We alternate external surveys every year between injured workers and employers. Our most recent, just wrapping up actually, you're kind of getting a, a, a preview here. It hasn't been officially launched yet, is our 2021 employer survey that compiles an index that has been used for a couple decades now. Um, and that index is at about 83.4% uh, on par with 2019. This year, we will be going back to the injured worker community. I'm going to be really brief here. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, occupational health and safety. I spoke earlier about it having its own act and regulations separate and distinct of Workers' Compensation Act. The operation, the way that manifests itself on the street, the work that we do is we have a collection of officers that do regular recurring inspections of workplaces. Uh, accident investigations right from being a first responder on scene right up to and including the file work of accident investigations. We have an education uh, division and within that specifically a focus on youth. Uh, one of the policies we did go out for consultation on this year was disclosure of OHS information. This just helped us, uh, I get a little bit firmer in our shoes about what and when we can release surrounding most notably um, uh, workplace accidents or incidents if and when it's normally the media calling but there was some, a, a good healthy debate and consultation um, between um, us we checked ourselves with the uh, VoIP office and just made sure we were in good stead there to be able to release information um, should should uh, the, the greater good be served by doing that. Uh, we will um, still not release specifics on cases as they are being investigated, names, things of that nature. Prince Edward Island is really too small to be doing that, but um, certainly we will uh, have a more consistent disclosure um, application of policy now. There wasn't one before with a pretty restrictive statement in our legislation. The last thing I want to touch on before I turn it very quickly over to Kate is our funding. I know that was the question. So we have a collective liability system. Uh, I know it goes without saying, but it's a good reminder. We do not receive any appropriation from government. We are 100% funded by assessment revenue. So a rate per $100 of payroll and investment returns. Um, employer participation is mandatory unless you happen to be excluded in our regulations. Rates have been trending downward over the last, uh, six, went up a titch last year, but over the last 10 years have been trending downward. Our, our legislation does require us to be fully funded. Underneath of that, we do have a very robust funding status uh, policy. And really what that is, permission to show my accountant here for a second, <laughs> funding status is simply a ratio. It is the ratio of your assets, what you own to what you owe. And uh, what we own, most notably, our most significant asset is our investment fund. What we owe, most significantly is a benefit liability pool. And that's a little bit difficult to get your head around. It's an actuarial valuation of the present day value 
of all the claims we have in the door right now, what they're going to cost till the end of time. So as long as if you have more assets than liability, your funding status is above 100%. That's good. If you have more uh, liability than you have assets, your funding status will be below 100%. That's bad. There, it wasn't too long in the uh, distant past that this organization was underfunded. Uh, we are far away from that now, so much so that in the last, um, I'll say, four out of five years, we have done a surplus distribution, and I know that was one of the questions at hand. So our funding policy targets about 125%. Sorry, Jody, you can go back just one sec. 125% funded, just to give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. Between 125 and 140% funded, we are able to apply a discount to current day rates. So to put that in a practical sense that everybody can understand, our required rate this year in 2022 was a buck 50. When invoices showed up to um, employers, it manifested itself as a dollar 43. Now that's the average rate. I don't know if anybody actually paid that rate, but you get the picture. Anywhere north of 140%, the board of directors has the discretion to order a surplus distribution back to employers. In large part, this has been borne the last number of years by the extraordinary performance of our investment fund. Um, and really that's as simple as it as it is, we were able to outpace um, some of the leading indexes far and away. So we return that in the form of a surplus distribution. You can go ahead now, Jody. Why do we do it that way? Because we really want to keep um, rates stable and we don't want to have them going up and down with, with the market, and we want them to be predictable for employers. Um, and it looks like, reading into the future here, we might be in this uh, situation again as we're wrapping up the 2021 investment earning um, period. Go ahead, Jody. Okay, I'm gonna turn it very quickly over to Kate, and I know we have to get to your questions. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, so uh, just from a claims perspective, um, the number of claims that we adjudicate in a year um, doesn't fluctuate significantly. Last year, it was 1,743. Um, and you'll see the breakdown of uh, claims that required time away from work. Um, denied claims, there were 149. And typically, those uh, relate to whether or not there was an accident at work. Um, and whether or not that an injury sustained was arising out of and in the course of employment and some timeframe limitation um, claims as well. Those are kind of the top three. Uh, so the average time from someone filing a claim to them receiving a, a payment uh, last year was 15 days and that's down um, from 16.2 in 2020. Uh, and I will just mention that the the last year was a bit of an anomaly for obvious reasons, and we had about 300 less claims in 2020 than, than a, a usual year. The top three areas of the body um, most commonly injured are the back, the arm, wrist, and hand, which is basically the upper extremity excluding the shoulder, um, and uh, the lower extremity, so hip, knee, ankle, and foot. And the, the most um, common injury type is soft tissue injuries. Our top three um, industries that um, where workers get injured, health and social services, and that includes private nursing homes, manufacturing and construction. Just wanna to touch on, on some, some of the more recent benefit enhancements that we've made. So from a legislative and regulatory perspective, we've increased the indexation of extended wage loss benefits, uh, pensions and survivor benefits from the 80% to 100%, uh, introduced new occupational health and safety workplace harassment regulations. Uh, we introduced a presumption for trauma and stressor related disorders. So uh, that kind of streamlines the process for uh, a worker who may be exposed to a traumatic event at work and, and is diagnosed with a trauma or stressor related disorder. 
we would presume that those two things correlate with each other and it make, makes it easier for workers to access benefits. Uh, similarly, presumptive coverage for firefighters for cancer and uh, heart injury. Uh, we introduced an annuity benefit um, for workers who transition to extended wage loss benefits. So this replaces the previous pension replacement benefit where the, the onus really was on the worker to kind of prove that they've lost pension income. The annuity benefit um, is, is open to many more workers making that, um, that type of benefit more fair. Uh, and we increased uh, some of the lump sum benefits. The death benefit was increased from $10,000 to 40% of the maximum annual earnings, which in 2022 would be $23,320. And also burial expenses uh, from $4,000 to $7,500. Thankfully, we, uh, we do not see many fatalities. Uh, from a policy perspective, we have introduced some, some new or enhanced allowances around clothing allowance, personal care, respite, uh, support for personal independence, some new uh, travel and accommodation allowances just to, uh, to make it easier and make sure that workers aren't out of pocket in the first instance. We, we've always um, reimbursed expenses, but these allowances make sure that workers have the money before they go, um, provided obviously it's not an emergency situation. And also family support for, for injured workers who are seriously injured. Um, we are always looking for new ways um, to help people with workplace injuries. So we've introduced a, a couple of new um, treatment types, massage therapy and approval of medical cannabis in, in some situations. And also we've enhanced home modifications and transportation assistance. So just a, a little bit about return to work, which is a cornerstone of what we do. We, we uh, firmly believe and understand the importance of work as an integral part of society and, and whole person wellness. Work is healthy, there's no doubt about that. Um, in, in 2020, almost 60% of our claimants had soft tissue injuries, which um, for the most part are, are not uh, significantly serious injuries, not to say that they uh, don't come with, with pain and, and disability. Typically though, um, there is some capacity to return to work after a period of healing. Um, so there's lots of return to work options that we have depending on a worker's abilities and their, their recovery. And we basically help determine uh, which return to work option is, is best for a worker's unique situation. It's a very individualized approach, although we do have um, various different programs. We have uh, access to multidisciplinary uh, resources to help us in that process and to, to, to try to get the most positive outcome after workplace injury that we can. So transitional duties such as knees, backs, um, modified duties, that type of thing, uh, right to vocational rehabilitation and, and extended wage loss benefits being kind of the end of the road. But we do have lots of clients on extended wage loss benefits who do have some capacity to work. They just can't work in the, in the same um, area or earn the amount of money that they earned before their injury. So we compensate for that. And just a, a very quick note on, on current trends. Obviously, COVID-19 is, is a huge national uh, trend for WCBs. We have adjudicated or, or approved a handful of, of COVID-19 claims. Um, obviously, with the Omicron virus, we're, we're seeing uh, workplace outbreaks, so we're anticipating that number will rise. And just a quick note on PTSD um, or trauma and stressor-related disorders, we've seen an increase in this type of injury in 2021. Not a huge number of workers, um, but we, we, these claims are very complex, um, very um, costly, um, and, and also not great outcomes at the end. The ability to return to work um, from PTSD is, is very difficult. Um, we've seen uh, a, a real kind of mixed bag of, of, um, of occupations, healthcare being the top one, uh, corrections, police, fire, paramedics. So um, not all um, first responders, certainly. And that's it for me.
Perfect. Um, so that is great. I really appreciate uh, the presentation and I appreciate you keeping it uh, very succinct. Um, so we are going to open up the uh, floor to members for questions and uh, Depending on uh, the number of members of questions, uh, we'll just try to make sure that everybody has a chance to ask some questions. We'll start with Trish. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that uh, really detailed presentation. There's a, certainly a lot to unpack there, and I do have, I do have a few questions. Um, before um, I talk or I ask uh, specifically about some of the things you mentioned in this presentation, I wanted to touch on the, uh, the most recent changes to the legislation on uh, the indexing formula. Uh, for wage loss benefits. And I was just wondering um, uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about why that change was made in, in making the indexation to 100% of CPI um, and, and how, uh, what some of the impacts are going to be of that. Sure, thank you for the question. So we are constantly uh, searching and balancing on a broad level to balance benefit enhancements to uh, rates to the employers. It's a bit of a teeter-totter. And under the banner of searching for uh, benefit enhancements, this one really stood out to us as uh, an opportunity uh, to enhance benefits, the right timing to, to do that. Uh, it, over the course of history, I think it has in the indexation. So what that means is, um, I know you understand this, Trish, but for the benefit of uh, others on the call, if you are on a, an extended wage uh, loss, for instance, we index those once per year based on Statistics Canada uh, CPI. Um, historically, we used to take that number, take 80% of it. We have a ceiling of 0%. So if there's negative CPI, workers are protected. And we still do have a ceiling of 4%. But historically, um, Kate, am I right in saying it used to be 75% and grew to 80? And we took uh, the opportunity as a quick win to take it from 80 to 100% as a benefit enhancement. Yes. Trish? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, and I do. I think it's it's certainly a step in the right direction. We were glad to see that change come forward. Um, but as you know, Cheryl, I, I did have some questions at the time uh, about you know what happens to injured workers who um, you know have been injured, have been receiving benefits for several years, and have only been indexed at eighty percent or seventy five percent before that, and have been you know falling behind year after year, uh, and may very well now be you know below. Um, you know, a livable, a livable benefit amount. Um, so I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about, uh, um, you know, whether or not those benefits could be adjusted retroactively, and, and if not, why? Sure. Thanks. Thanks again for the question. I know we've gone around the the bush on this a couple times, and I fully appreciate the the case that you're making. Really, it comes down uh, for us on retroactive application of legislative changes causes a whole host of uh, uh, unfavorable circumstances, not the least of which is uh, opening up all, the, all those decisions that I spoke about earlier in the thousands, <laughs> they all become, if you don't have a firm base of legislation to base those on at a time, they all become questionable and suspect and really could clog up the system if every time we make a change we try to go back uh whatever one year five years ten years forever it really clogs up the system and makes uh it very difficult for our decision makers to ever um correctly apply the legislation if it's fluid in its nature and, and that's really at a, a kind of a, a broad level the answer to your question the um real substance perhaps uh, of the question i do appreciate you know if it's 20 percent. i think the average cpi i don't want to misspeak here on the call but it was tracking 1.6 or 7 percent and i don't want to belittle the math but it is um a, a small benefit enhancement it's the right one to make but i'm wondering we are in a uh, President, unprecedented time of inflationary. We're told it's going to be short-lived, um, most recently last week by the by the Bank of Canada. But we that cap that I spoke of of four percent, when we were looking at amending this legislation for the last 25 years, we've never needed it. We might need it this year. That might be a quicker hit to 
um, make sure that a, a further benefit enhancement, if I could say it that way, and I might even offer that up as uh, for suggestion. If we move quickly, that could happen before the next time we index benefits, perhaps. To answer your, your first question, I don't see any um, fair and equitable way to go back and uh, kind of uh, cut checks for the difference before the legislation changes. I, I don't. Trish? Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the complexity of, of this and the challenge of, of going back, uh, you know, in time and, and trying to rectify, you know, where there, the, the uh, situations where, where people were at a loss uh, because of those changes or because of uh, the, the CPI uh, indexation in the past. Um, moving forward, though. So without you know cutting a check to a, a deal with what happened in the past, just putting that aside, uh, moving forward, can uh, what can be done in terms of a, like a, a one-time readjustment so that in the future, moving forward, um, uh, the issues around uh, not being indexed at, at 100% of CPI, um, and particularly, I'm worried about those workers who were you know minimum wage or low wage workers at the time they were injured, let's say 10, you know, 20 years ago in some cases, and have been you know only been indexed at 75 or 80% over time. Um, you know, is there an ability uh, to uh, adjust the legislation or to to uh, to have a one time shift in their payment amount? So in the future, moving forward, they're paid at a uh, a livable amount, an amount that it recognizes the cost of living. Under the, the current legislation, as it's written, we, we kind of see it as the same thing uh, retroactively uh, if you're calculating a new base or. Uh, cutting a check, applying uh, legislation retroactively. If it's the pleasure of the lawmakers, anything can be written into the legislation is, is how I'll leave that. But uh, we have gone around the horn on this a couple times and maybe I'll let Stephen uh, speak to this, but we feel that either would be retroactive application. Stephen, did you want to speak? I think probably Ms. Altas would, would know what I'm going to say. I spoke for an hour and a half, but there's a third reading, I think, and, and I, I think we're, I, I don't have much to add to what Cheryl has other than I, I think our, our focus for, uh, for workers should be on a go-forward basis and making the system better. It, whether Whether you're just trying to create a new base or whether you're talking about going back and, and providing someone with some lump sum for a loss in the future and in, in the past, it it kind of is the same thing. You're you're it's doing tri time travel and making some kind of a calculation. So the legislature can do that. You can have legislative amendments that have a retroactive or a retrospective uh, effect. There's no doubt. It's rare. It's not really um, the preference usually because. I've said this before, but employers, citizens, everyone, you, you generally have a right to know what the law is at the time and plan your affairs accordingly. So things with a retroactive or retrospective application are are not ideal by any means. And I I think the, the biggest thing for me just personally sitting here is, and it's hard to appreciate unless you're probably in our seats, but we we are constantly looking at benefit enhancements, uh, that teeter-totter that Cheryl described. And if, you know, when we go to make a move and an enhancement, we're kind of worried about, well, do we have to go back and, you know, 10 years and, and, and address some of those people who unfortunately missed out, which is unfortunate. It, it has a little bit of a, uh, a chilling effect on uh, uh, the vigor with which you might pursue some of those <laughs> you know, future benefit enhancements. So I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add. But end of the day, it's right. If lawmakers tell us to do it, we can do it. It's a mathematical calculation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Trish, I'm gonna go with one more question and then I'm gonna move on. We have a few more members here that would like to ask some questions. 
Okay, yeah, no problem. So, uh, Stephen, I just I want to just acknowledge, uh, and, and I had mentioned this as well when, when we did discuss this legislation on the floor, that um, my question is in no way in reference to a lump sum payment. So I'm not suggesting that that is the, is the answer. Um, what I do think we should be doing is rather than looking at uh, the impact of the people on the seats making these decisions, I'm very concerned about the people on the seats who are directly impacted by um, not being uh, uh, receiving a benefit amount that does account for the cost of living and as such are not able to meet their basic needs. Those are the folks that I'm, I'm most concerned about. Um, and we can't correct what happened in the past necessarily. I hear what you're saying. Uh, certainly we can't go back in time. Uh, but what we can do is set a new amount for those folks moving forward so that we no longer ignore the fact that they are falling behind and they have fallen behind. So that's really, you know, and I, I do appreciate the acknowledgement that it is really in the purview of the of lawmakers to decide how this goes moving forward. But I just wanted to get on get that on the record and for clarity, because we seem to keep you know, side sidestepping the the what I'm actually trying to ask. No lump sum payment. That's not what I'm suggesting. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so uh, has there been any calculation then of of uh, of what uh, what um, what the increased costs would be uh, to uh, you know if there were adjustments made moving forward? How many individuals are uh, you know would be impacted? Have have not met the uh, the adjustments over time, uh, and in particular those who are now you know well below um, a livable income. I, th I think I'll let probably Cheryl speak to the the number side of it. I I could answer your question, but I think it would be better answered by Cheryl. So mm -hmm. if you're okay, Cheryl, do you want to take that one? Sure. We have done some modeling to answer your question. Um, so just for size and context, I always try to to do that in any conversation. Currently, at any given time, we would have plus minus 850-ish uh, claimants on extended wage loss case. So there becomes the first question. Are we talking about going back one year, three years, five years, 10 years? Because that number can multiply uh, quickly. To answer your question, uh, we have done some modeling on that 850, and it's 850 separate and distinct uh, calculations. It's, uh, I, I don't want to misspeak now, it is somewhere in the vicinity of, um, I believe, we assumed a three-year period, it's uh, north of a quarter million dollars. I don't have that document right here, but we have done work on it to answer your question. Thank you, Cheryl. So we're going to move on now, and Trish, you can go back on the list if you want. We're going to go to Sonny. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and uh, Stephen and Kate. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, on your total claims adjudicated in 2021, temporary wage loss, could you explain that? Like, is there a difference between temporary and extended income loss? Like, was there nobody that had an extended loss in 2021? Or are they all temporary? And what is temporary? Is it six months, six weeks? How does it vary? Want me to take that one? Okay. Uh, so those are claims that we adjudicated that right at the outset of their injury or some uh, at some time close to their injury, they required wage loss benefits. So um, when we kind of go through that process of, um, uh, of recovery and uh, exploring options for return to work, um, we may get to extended wage loss benefits at some point, whether that be um, an inability for someone to return to work or um, an ability for someone to return to work but, but not um, earning the same as they were prior to their injury. So they're, they're, people don't transition to extended wage loss until we've kind of explored um, all of those options or, or appropriate options. Thank you, Kate. Sonny? So you, you said something, Kate, that triggered another question. So if they, somebody was making X dollars and they got injured and they went back to work eight months later at a lesser amount, you pay the difference? We do, yes. So we compensate for loss of earning capacity, which is the difference between pre-injury and, and post-injury earnings. And that would be... And, sorry. sorry. No, you go ahead. Sorry. 
When we transition someone to extended wage loss benefits, we, we bring that earning amount up to current day dollars. Um, so for whatever period of time someone is on temporary wage loss benefits, um, whether that be six weeks or, or, I mean, two years in an extreme case, um, we would adjust um, that earnings rate before we calculate extended wage loss benefits to make sure that when that worker transitions to extended wage loss benefits, their earning rate is reflective of current day dollars. Okay, Sonny? Okay, so I'm just trying to get my head around this. So, and Cheryl mentioned it, and, and it was a question I was going to ask. So there's about 850 people on extended income loss? At the moment, yeah, the that, moment. that can fluctuate a little bit. So when you say fluctuate, could it go to, does it ever go down or does it just keep going up? It, it depends. Uh, it depends how many people we transition to extended wage loss benefits in any given year. Um, extended wage loss benefits are paid until a worker attains the age of 65. And so there's, there's also workers coming off extended wage loss benefits as well. It's not a significant fluctuation typically. Thank you. One more question there, Sonia. I'm going to move on. You have other members. Okay. Could I have one more? Could I have two? Start with one. <laughs> anyway, Start with one. My next question is, okay, it seems like you got pretty nailed down numbers here, 6,003 employers and 76,700 employees. Is there anybody exempt from workman's comp, any industry anymore? Yes, great question. Uh, by way of um, regulation, our fishing sector is still excluded by regulation, and we have a handful of odds and sod, uh, age-old legislative language of uh, exclusions by occupation that has such words as, you may have to help me here, Kate, contortionists and door-to-door -door peddlers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most substantive one, uh, Sunny, is uh, fishing industry. Thanks. On water fishing. Okay, thank you. Did you have a short follow-up? Just or? a short follow-up. Okay. Okay. You indicated the three top loss injuries by industry, like health and social services, including private nursing homes, manufacturing construction. So what triggers somebody's premiums to increase in other sectors? Is it repeat injuries or is it the industry as a whole? What would trigger somebody's premiums to go up a significant amount? Uh, both of what you said. Uh, I don't want to get way down the weeds, but we break our that average rate that I spoke about in my presentation. Probably no employer play, pays that. That's distributed amongst rate groups and rate groups are uh, groups of um, uh, like risk-minded uh, businesses. So uh, manufacturing would be a higher rated uh, rate group than a uh, office administration uh, group. So both your, your, your rate, your industry performance, and your individually uh, individual firm employer performance. If you've had experience, uh, your rate is then experience rated up or down compared to your peers. So just like your car insurance, if you've had a claim, your premium's going one way. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, Mark? Hi, Cheryl. Um, quick question, I guess, from, from your presentation, what I was looking to see is maybe some three- and five-year trends, like how it, apply, you know, how it apply to number of claims, the reconsideration levels, the timeliness. Like, what's the trends? Can you speak to kind of number of claims, the, the level of reconsiderations, the timeliness, and even the satisfaction levels. Nice to see what, what they are over the next, you know, over the past five years, where you're trending. Great question. We are a kind of steady eddy organization here, uh, Mark, with COVID being the biggest curveball we've had. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, in, insofar as number of claims, we're kind of rock solid in around the 1900 level and plus or minus a 10% um, or a, speaking the positive, a 90% acceptance rate of those claims. And that's kind of stood the test of time on our worker and employer satisfaction surveys. The last uh, 19 and 20 were the highest ratings that we've had, but they've been, it's not a hockey stick graph, it's steady, steady eddy. Um, Insofar as if you're looking to that uh, appeals chart, Mark, year over year, um, 
pretty consistent there, although probably a good number of, of members on the call today remember a bit of a, a back, I know Sunny will remember a bit of a backlog a handful of years ago in the appeals stream. So we will fight really hard so that doesn't happen again, but on a num comparative number uh, to number year over year, there's no big discrepancies. We're, we're really steady Eddie. So, Mark? so any, any of those alarm you or concern you trending the wrong ways? So any of those, those metrics at all? Uh, well, I mean, we spoke a little bit of it. It's a good problem to have, but our funded status is, um, I think that is going to self-correct a little bit with market returns this year. So that one has caused us great uh, debate and policy review and all that kind of uh, uh, stuff. We are currently tracking north of 150% funded. Great problem to have when we look to some of our counterparts across the region, uh, you know, uh, and again, just for context, our average rate, again, nobody probably pays that rate, but our average assessment rate, Mark, this year is $1.43. It's 265 in Nova Scotia, and they're underfunded or just barely at 100. So it's a good problem to have, but it's a problem just the same to be overfunded. So we're we're digging in and looking at that, but the markets may correct that for us when uh, interest rates go up here shortly. Mark. Okay, great. Yeah, I was going to ask how we compared to other Atlantic regions. So any significant workforce changes in PEI that we see? Uh, happening that may affect WCB going forward? Are we transitioning to more to white collar or more to injury prone industry, so to speak? Is there any data on that? Uh, well, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I don't have that. What I can tell you is probably the most significant takeaway for the Prince Edward Island workforce is its uh, resilience. Our, so our accessible payroll is about $2.2 billion with a B. <laughs> So there's two points to our revenue. There's the assessable payroll and the average rate. And if you do that math, our, our assessment revenue is 36 or 37 million. So if the economy falters or wages contract, obviously that is a cause of concern to our system and assessment revenue coming in. Even through COVID and large credit to both the provincial and federal governments for some of the filling in the gaps through COVID of wages, we actually saw wages grow last year through COVID. So uh, not that wouldn't be immediately intuitive to think, but the Prince Edward Island economy is, and that has a lot to do with our, our funding status too. It is chugging along very nicely, not to take away from the current crisis in the farming sector and some of the hard hit, Mark, you and I come from the tourism industry. It's uh, a significant uh, hit to the economy, and some of that, yes, has been filled in, um, certainly in the last year, probably with some health care wages and things of that nature. But the resilience of the Prince Edward Island accessible payroll is a trend that you should be aware of. Thank you. Mark? That's fine. Okay. You're good. Thanks. Uh, Lynn? Thank you, Chair for your presentation today. This has been really interesting for sure. I was just wondering if you can give me a sense of what it means when there is a surplus in the um, Injured Workers Fund. Is this the result of, of high return because of a good investment, for example, or is this the result of lack of funds being paid out or a little bit of both? Maybe you could speak to that. Great question. So our philo philosophy when we're setting rates is to charge current day employers the current cost of claims. So I spoke about earlier, we apply a very thin subsidy when we are overfunded up to and including about a maximum of eight cents per hundred. And I know that's hard to get your head around, but um, the, the first premise is we try to charge what it costs employers today. Separate and distinct of that is we have a $231 or $2 million investment fund. And we, as a, um, a premise, try to match that investment portfolio so that the returns it generates matches 
the growth in that benefit liability that we talked about earlier. So when the investment portfolio shows its muscle and outperforms the growth and the benefit liability, um, there, there is a surplus. To, so to put a finer point on that, it most has to do with investment returns and does not have to do with current, as much to do with current uh, payouts, if I can say it that way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that explanation. That makes a lot of sense. That actually preempts a couple of my questions, so I appreciate that. I'm wondering if you can give me a sense of how long the practice of giving that money back to employers has been around for. Sure. I, I think it's been uh, triggered five times now, Lynn, uh, to a grand total of uh, somewhere in the vicinity, a, a total of $80 million. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I had looked on the workers' compensation annual reports, and since 2015, I can see maybe about $100 million that has been returned to employers over the course of, of a number of years. Last year was $25.5 million. And it makes me think of some of the questions my colleague Trish Altaz was just asking about what it would cost to um, bring previous workers up to the 100% index that she was talking about, and you had indicated it would be about a quarter of a million dollars. I'm well, just well, as broad as it is deep. We took a we took a quick swipe at it and assumed a two or three year. So that would require a, a ton of more uh, uh, of more work. But you kind of get away from the premise of charging your current day employers with current day costs based on current legislation. I mean, we're back to the. We're back to the same argument again, but uh, we we go through and use actuaries to help us with that, so we don't have the employers of tomorrow paying for the employers of today's costs. If that makes sense. Thank you, Cheryl. Lynn. Go to the chair. Thank you, chair. But uh, I appreciate that. It seems to me that in the last seven years, we have returned about $100 million, and I, I can understand your, your point of wanting present-day employers to be paying present-day rates. I can appreciate that. I guess I'm just curious how we got to the decision that that was going to be the primary focus instead of making sure that, um, that people were getting a livable benefit. I'm just wondering how we've made that that distinction. Well, I, I don't think anybody took that decision. I think we, what we have done over the course of time, and we can, you know, emphatically show over the last number of years, constantly increasing benefits. The CPI adjustment is one small, with all due respect, it's one small benefit enhancement of many we've done over the course of the last uh, number of years. So we try to balance Think of it as a, a three-legged stool. Benefit enhancements as one, the real cost to the employers and not just spending it because we have it and returning excess funds to them and developing our own services here in-house so we can offer workers and employers alike uh, enhanced services. Uh, the best example I could think of that would be uh, we uh, recently, within the next month, we'll have an occupational hygienist join us here at the board. We have never had that before, and we think that will add greatly to the fabric of health and safety, education, and development of risk assessments across workplaces in the island. If we ran, to come back to Stephen's point of earlier, it, we targeted 125% funded, so we didn't run everything to the line, so we weren't forced in making these. Um, we, we could drive all three agendas at the same time. I can answer it that way. And we have not traded one off for the other. I think we've been very successful, particularly in the last four or five years, of making strides in each of those um, uh, stool legs, if I can say it that way. Lynn, one more, and then uh, move on. Thank you, Chair. I will say I can understand there have been a number of other adjustments that have been made outside of this one that we're talking to, and I appreciate that. But I also hear from a number of constituents for whom their benefit has not kept up with inflation and the impact it has on their lives is substantial. So I will say, um, I guess I don't have another question, but 
from my perspective, knowing that there is a hundred million dollars in the last seven years that could have potentially been used to improve the quality of their lives. Um, it's hard for me to not feel like that would have been worthy of further consideration, but I will leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Gord? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and um, the one thing that I'm looking at this that stands out to me is the, is the health uh, numbers where you have 29.5 percent of claims to uh, that are related to health or social services. What when I look at this, and then you look at back injuries, um, are these coming from from lifts at, at private nursing homes and and and, and hospitals? Are, are people getting hurt um, by lifting other patients? And I look at it and say, um, you know, we're down in we're down in numbers. That's sometimes there's a two person lift, sometimes there's a three person lift. Can you just expand on why those numbers are so high? Do you want to try that one, Kate? Sure. Um, well, in, in answer to your first question, uh, yes, the, the, the highest kind of mechanism of injury is related to um, transfers, lifts, uh, repositioning of patients. Um, so, so yes, that's that is the most prevalent um, injury type. Gord, so I'm looking at this and it's so high. Um, uh, are are we doing enough? I guess my question was: Are these numbers on par with with the rest of the country? And are we doing enough um, to look at it from a preventive point of view? And what it, what it, what is your organization doing to uh, to assist and get that number down? Uh, yes, healthcare is definitely um, one of the most prevalent injury industries uh, in the country uh, across the board. Um, here at the, the Workers' Compensation Board of PEI, we have a, uh, an occupational health and safety officer that's dedicated to health care. So that's certainly one thing that we're doing. We've also um, had a number of uh, initiatives with uh, health PEI in particular. Um, to, to try to, to help them to reduce uh, the number of injuries and also the, the, uh, the impact of injuries. Gordon? Yeah, and I, I guess that, that industry is stressed and when you see that number so high with that many people out, it's adding to a lot of stress at this time. And, um, you know, as I look at that, so if, say, if I was a substitute teacher and I got a, a little job for a little bit in a private nursing home, just recently, and I got hurt um, lifting somebody, but I'm only filling in. What is the process as coming in as a substitute teacher? Would I? How, how does? How do, How would you look at a claim that way? Um, so, when someone's injured and they have um, more than one job, um, we look at we look at total income loss. So, um, we're able. Our legislation provides us the ability to. Um, to set workers up on pre-injury earnings, whatever those may be, and we can review those earnings. So we can look at a, um, a one-year period in the previous two years to the injury. So um, we, we set up benefits based on what best reflects the worker's loss of earnings. Gord? Another question. And, and then just last question. Can you give me a number, a relative number about what that 29.5% would look like in terms of how many people would be off in that sector? Um, I don't know exactly how many would be off, but there's about um, th between 300 and 350 claims a year adjudicated for health PEI employees. Thank you. So we are at 2.30. Um, I know that uh, Trish has another question. Maybe if it's all right with our presenters, we'll uh, go for maybe another couple minutes, if that would be all right. Perfect. If that's okay, I'm getting a few nods. Trish? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, yes, I did. Um, actually, I just want to build off of the, the questions that uh, Gord was asking there for a second. And I'm wondering... Um, we spoke. Uh, he asked you about what your organization is doing to uh, to help address the the high numbers of time loss injuries in healthcare. And I'm wondering what more um, would you recommend that you know that government can do or that workplaces can do uh, to to help decrease those numbers. I love that question. Thank you. 
<laughs> a number of things. I mean, we have most recently, uh, our, our conversations with Health PEI are ongoing. Um, they have um, some, some new people in their, their roles, most uh, substantially manager of uh, occupational health and safety. And she has a very robust plan specific for that sector that I think she is trying to navigate up through the system. But I, I would suggest that, uh, you know, if, if eyes wanted to have a look at that, it, it's very comprehensive in, in what uh, she is recommending for that sector in particular. Trish, if uh, you have maybe one more question and then uh, we'll probably wrap things up, okay? Okay. Oh, it's so tough. I do have more questions, but I, I um, yeah, so that is a challenge. I guess, uh, you know, along the same lines around the, the healthcare question, I am wondering if there's been um, a change over time in these numbers. So um, ha has healthcare, how long has it been sort of the number one um, time loss injury uh, by industry? And if that's, if that's changed um, over time, and then I do have other questions, but I, I guess we'll just go with that one. Oh, it's so tough to choose. I, it's steady, Eddie, and unfortunately, it's been way too long. And Prince Edward Island is not, it doesn't make it right to, to say we're not alone in that regard, but healthcare across the country has for a long time been um, the, the number one sector in workers' compensation claims. Uh, th thank you very much, Cheryl, uh, Stephen, and Kate. I, I do have one uh, wrap-up question, if that's all right. Um, just with the new provincial ombudsperson starting um, later this month, uh, I'm wondering if there will be either collaboration um, between departments or, because again, as MLAs, we do receive uh, you know calls and emails about um, workers' compensation claims and uh, concerns, et cetera. Like, do you think that the ombudsperson will be a person that they would be reaching out to as well, or? A good question. I mean, I've read the legislation. I don't know the size and scope of that office or, or how that would look, but we are more than willing to work, obviously, with that office. We do try to separate our uh, kind of calls from uh, stakeholders into, like I talked about earlier, the claim side and the, and the service side. Most substantively, they've, they're related to claims. Um, and yes, I realize each of you um, you know, living and working and having constituents have questions on, on claims. And I would say, don't wait for that. Reach out to us in, in, the, uh, in the immediate term if you have questions or concerns. Um, sometimes the devil's in the explanation and the outcome may not be different, uh, but sometimes it's in the understanding of the decision. Um, but to circle back and put a finer point on that, we remain open, willing, and, and able to work with that office. We just don't know what it's going to look like yet, so don't, don't wait for it. Reach out to us in the interim. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. And again, thank you for staying a few extra minutes. So we do have uh, another presentation upcoming, so we're going to take just a very brief recess, and we will be back. Thank you.
And we are back uh, for the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Um, uh, we do apologize. We're a few minutes uh, behind there, uh, Carl, but uh, we do want to uh, welcome our next guest. We're going to be receiving a briefing from the PEI Federation of Labour on, on a number of different topics as well, and uh, President Carl Percy and Administrative Assistant Christina Dusky. Uh, so we're going to turn things over to you, Carl, and Christ uh, excuse me, and uh, Christina. And uh, after the presentation, the, the members will have some questions if that's okay you might be on mute Carl can you maybe speak again uh, we're, we're not hearing anything just to maybe keep speaking we're gonna get our uh, team here at the Legislative Assembly just to make sure we've got all the connections set up still oh no Still nothing yet, Carl. We're going to just take a brief recess, and we will be back momentarily. back sorry about that the technical difficulties but I think we've got them all ironed out so again uh, we're going to uh, be joined here by Carl Percy uh, the president from the PEI Federation of Labor and uh, Carl we're going to turn things over to you uh, I believe you uh, have a few things or a little presentation some things to say and then our members are going to ask some questions so Carl I'll turn things over to you okay thank you can you hear me there all right now we can hear you perfectly now thank you okay Yes, uh, Chair, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present here today and the members of the committee as well. Uh, at the PEI Federation of Labour here, uh, we represent over 16,000 unionized workers here in PEI. And we also speak for a lot of the non-unionized workers at all. Also, they call us when they have problems. Uh, we have 15 different locals of CUPE that are part of the Federation. Uh, and they work mostly in health and education. Uh, also, we have postal workers. Um, 
uh, theater employees, the electricians, um, the PEI Nurses Union, uh, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, which is the federal government employees, um, the United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, the PEI Faculty Association at the university, and UPSI, which is the provincial government workers, uh, the operating engineers, and the Charlottetown Professional Firefighters Association. So we represent quite a few workers here in PEI. And first off, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that we're on the unceded territory of uh, the Mi'kmaq people here in PEI. And uh, I'll start with my presentation then. Uh, the first thing you wanted to hear on was uh, the province's economic recovery. Um, I think that uh, we need to have um, fully employed and decent paid and product and productive jobs, because uh, and only strong public investment can lead to a recovery. Uh, lifting incomes and economic activity that will in turn stimulate business investment, uh, and we need to have investment in people and communities. Um, public investment in infrastructure, childcare and other enhancing job created initiatives uh, will pay for themselves with greater labor market participation, higher productivity, rising incomes, and increased tax revenue. Uh, uh, workers need to receive permanent uh, higher wages and nobody can live on what's being paid now uh, the $15 an hour minimum wage is something that needs to be initiated immediately. And we need to, re to then look, focus on uh, having a living, a living wage for workers so they can afford to live and rent and buy houses and everything else, which will keep everything stimulated. Um, we also need public investment in uh, physical, social, and green infrastructure. Uh, an economic recovery plan should... Uh, prioritize investment in social infrastructure, including investments in acute health, long-term care, home care, early childhood education, and care centers, post-secondary education, recreation centers, and arts and cultural installations. Reinvesting and expanding quality public services will reduce inequality and ensure a broad-based inclusive economic recovery. Uh, green, green and climate resilient infrastructure projects uh, should also be a focus. Uh, the green economy investments in public transit, green and renewable energy, uh, energy conservation measures, home and building retrofits will generate decent jobs and allow us to achieve a climate change targets, uh, providing free high speed Broadband access to all parts of the island uh, is a high priority, and especially for low income, isolated, and rural communities. Um, PEI needs more affordable and public housing for low income, homeless, precariously housed populations, including Indigenous Canadians, survivors of domestic violence, and people living with disabilities. Um, also on uh, the next topic on uh, skill gaps in, in the workforce, uh, I think that uh, we need to look at the way things, our training programs are done. Um, because what's happening now in a lot of cases, uh, there's employers that get training money to train workers, but once they reach the Red Seal level, they have no work for them anymore and they come back to government to uh, get another 20 or so workers as in some cases, uh, to, so they can retrain them and use the training money and the province and taxpayers' dollars for training when they don't retain people. And these skilled workers then have to leave the province to go somewhere else at a time when we're looking for workers here. Um, let's see, and then labor shortages. What's causing the labor shortages here is poor wages. People are going west to look for work if they can't make the money here, or if they can't qualify to get trained for something they want to be trained in, 
they're gone west to work. So uh, if we, we do have the workers here, we just don't have the wages. And we're calling for $15 an hour minimum wage right now with a slow increase to a livable income and tied to the rate of inflation. So I think this is what we need to do because this will all be money that's spent in our communities and the whole place, everybody will benefit. Um, the in, uh, barriers to recruiting retaining immigrants. I think a lot of the problem there is um, we need to make these workers citizens. Right now they're coming here working, they can only come for terms and they're, they only come so many years at a time. They send their money back to the country where they came from. The money's not spent here to stimulate the economy. If we need more workers, we should bring them in, let them bring their families in and let them uh, work here and be productive workers and uh, pay and spend their money here instead of the country where they come from. And also this would give them rights to their benefits under EI, which they can't, uh, they can't achieve right now. And also for Canada pension and well, as, as that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, like I said, the big thing here is we need decent paying jobs here in the island to keep people here. So uh, that's it. Is there any questions or anything? Th th thank you, Carl. Yeah, uh, we're going to start uh, uh, with Trish Altas. Trish, uh, you have some questions? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Carl. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Carl, I did I did want to just uh, elaborate on some of what you said around the challenges with our labor shortages and particularly the role of, of poor wages uh, being uh, one of the issues. So, um, you know, the we often hear about the basic idea of supply and demand, and, you know, with that sort of idea, you might assume that, you know, with labor shortages, that would create upward pressure on wages. Uh, so is that something that you're seeing happening at all? Uh, well, no, I, I think that with the poor wages, people are leaving and they're going west to work. And I think if we, if the wages went up here, uh, we would recruit, the, the workers would, would be returning home and we wouldn't see them leaving here. Trish? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, you know, uh, Carl, you also spoke about the importance of, yeah, retaining workers here and their families. And, and uh, you know, I wonder about the, the impacts of the current housing crisis. Is this something that you see as a challenge for uh, recruiting and retaining workers? Yes, because lots of people making decent salaries now do not make enough to qualify to get a mortgage. And so that's the ones don't qualify to get a mortgage if they're making decent salaries. And we have all the other ones that are making less money that don't qualify for mortgages. And I think what we needs to be done is some money put into affordable housing by the province uh, so that there is affordable housing and grants given to people so they can build their own houses. And this, because the, the current system is not working where the grants is given to developers to create it. And we all see what happens when that happens. Developers get millions of dollars for a project and they're the ones that make the money and nobody has a home that they own that they can look after after it's paid for. So I think we need, and if we do get into uh, giving grants like they did back in the 70s um, for people to build their own houses, it would make more work for everybody. Uh, more people would be working and people would own their own houses and I think it would solve the problem. Trish? Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And I wonder as well, um, you know, as we continue to struggle, you know, with the pandemic and uh, uh, the, the impacts that that has on businesses and workers, you know, one of the things that we're hearing from across the country is um, the uh, need for access to paid sick days. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the Federation of Labor's uh, um, position on paid sick days and what you, uh, what you think should be done. Yes, I think uh, this is a very important issue. We've mentioned it to government before, but seem to be getting nowhere with it. Uh, I think everybody should have up to 10 paid sick days because people that have the sick days, they're not gonna use them just because they have them. This is already shown in workplaces where they do have sick days. But I think someone that works summer for 10 or 12 years or more and is not entitled to one sick day, I think there's something wrong with the whole system. Trish? So this is something that's needed. Sorry, Trish? Thank you. Um, and I will just, I'll ask one more question um, uh, and then you can you can move on uh, and I'll get back on the list if that's okay, Chair. Um, I'm wondering about, uh, you mentioned uh, minimum wage and uh, that 
right away moving to $15 minimum wage at least, and then looking at uh, increasing that over time to a living wage. Um, so I'm wondering if you can give any suggestions on how we can improve the process by which we determine uh, minimum wage here on Prince Edward Island, because that does kind of restrict how and when those changes can happen. Okay, well, I think if we were to move to uh, a livable income and then have costs as per whatever inflation is added on each year, then you wouldn't need your commission each year to say what minimum wage should be. Uh, they never paid enough, you know, it's never, it's never been enough for people to live on, but I think we have to have a system where people have make enough money to live on. And they say, if you pay people more, it's gonna put the prices up everywhere. Well, we've all seen what's happened in the grocery stores. Uh, they're making record profits, millions, millions and millions every month more than they've ever made. And they still haven't decided to increase any wages in these places. And any that did put it up a couple of do dollars an hour, a lot of them was only for a short period of time. So uh, it, by increasing the wages, we'll also put more money out in the community because people working around the minimum wage and they don't save money, they don't put it away, they spend every cent and circulate it many times over back into the economy, as well as they'd be paying more taxes as well. So I think this is where we have to go so people can afford to live with some dignity and whether it's through that or guaranteed income or something, uh, something has to be done so people have some money. Thank you, Carl. Uh, next, we'll go to Lynn. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Carl, for joining us today. It's great to hear your thoughts on all of these things. There's just one other area that I was hoping I could hear some of your perspective on, if you don't mind. Government is currently conducting a review of the Employment Standards Act. And I was just wondering if there are any, any changes that you think are important to see in that review or anything that you think we should be looking for. Well. I, I think uh, we have to do a lot of looking at employment standards, uh, that a lot of them need to be brought up uh, and increased and made better. And maybe we should have uh, national standards and the whole thing looked at so that we all meet the same standards across the country uh, because employers are across the country. So the standards I think should be similar, but I don't think there should be anything done to reduce the standards that's there. It should only be to improve the, the the employment standards and working conditions for workers. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Carl. I really don't have any other questions. Have a nice day. Thank you. Any other members that have any questions? Trish, you had mentioned that you wanted to be back on the list. I'm going to go to Mark here first. Mark? Hey, Carl. Um, thanks for your time today. A uh, couple quick questions. What, what kind of barriers do you see in PEI for you know, people looking to upskill and, and improve their, 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 their careers on Prince Edward Island. What kind of barriers do we, the, does the Federation of Labor see in the upskilling process? Okay, I, I see a lot of barriers there, and some of them come from the fact uh, that it's decided by government what courses and whatnot they're going to put up on. I think that uh, the Federation of Labor, along with the employers' union, should be together uh, for labor market degree, uh, development money and talk about programs that are gonna be run that's needed beforehand, rather than be told what programs they did in the last year. Now, I know this is a, a requirement now in the money that comes from Ottawa, but it's, it's still not being lived up on with two. We still don't have input before programs are run, and uh, I imagine employers are the same way, but I'd like to see everybody sit down in the same room and decide what, where the training money needs to go. Uh, if we're given employers money to train people for work, uh, are they still in the same business? Or is their company just going back and getting more money and training another bunch of workers that will never find work here in the island? So I think we have to do more training too for healthcare workers and that type of stuff. We need, we need more. We need to find out where, what our needs are and what our future needs are going to be. Uh, and I think the only way we can do that is everybody working together, the government, the workers and the employers. Thank you, Carl. Mark, you're good. Uh, Trish. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Carl, I just have one more question, just on uh, the province's economic recovery. And I'm wondering, you know, what elements uh, do we need to see an inclusive economic recovery? And uh, in, do you feel that the uh, current plan uh, for economic recovery, the plans that we've heard of, are inclusive and progressive? 
Yes, and this needs to include all the groups too, like the women, uh, women's uh, disabled groups, indigenous, and uh, all all, uh, all levels. Because uh, I know at one time, seventy percent of the workers working at the minimum wage level were women. So we need to address the gender inequality issues as well. And this is something where government needs to sit down more with with the the Federation of Labor and the employers to decide what's needed, where, and how. Trish? Yeah, just one more follow-up question. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen happen a few times now, uh, you know, in different different areas of government, different departments, different issues, um, you know, in healthcare and in education is, um, uh, we've heard unions come forward and say that they haven't been uh, properly consulted on different issues. And I, I don't wanna um, perhaps go uh, elaborate too much on that today, but how important is it for government to consult with, uh, with unions? What are the benefits of that? And what are the risks when, when they don't? Well, I think if, if we started this with everybody working together, uh, we'd solve an awful pile of problems. They could be solved right and nipped right in the bud rather than festering and going on and making working conditions worse. I know the government's done some great work in health on this uh, because they are meeting now with the four unions in healthcare and Dr. Gardham and the minister and we've, we've had meetings and they're trying to address the problem and fix it. So this is one area that I'd like to call on everybody to not do any cuts to healthcare funding. Let's give the health PEI all the money they need. So they, they've identified their problems. They're trying to work and fix on them. Uh, we're working together with them. And uh, Dr. Gardham's doing a great job there. And, uh, you know, and things are completely different than they were even a couple of years ago. So again, thanks to the government for the good work they're doing there. And let's continue it. Trish? That's all, Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I, I think uh, all of our members uh, have had all of uh, their questions answered by you, so we do thank you very much for your time and your input here today, and uh, we wish you a, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. So, members, uh, we will continue on um, with our agenda. So uh, next on our agenda is uh, new business. Is there any new business? And I'll ask for a motion for adjournment. Mark McLean, so moved. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon, everyone.